Well, good morning, everybody. I uh, want to welcome you all. Everybody that's online, welcome as well. I, yeah, it's right there. Okay, cool. Um, welcome everybody online as well. Um, I'm going to start off with kind of a strange question, especially on a cold January morning. But by a show of hands, how many golfers do we have out there? Okay, fine. Okay, a few of you. It's good to know that I'm not the only one who enjoys spending four hours of a perfectly good afternoon traversing roughly 150 acres of farmland in a small dune buggy devoid, any, devoid of any discernible suspension in search of a dimpled two-inch white ball. <laughs> so for those of you who are golfers out there, can anyone tell me who these three guys are? Palmer, Nicholas, and Player, even in the right order. Cool, yeah. So um, these, are, these guys, Arnold Palmer, Jack, Nicholas, Gary, Player, golf's original band of brothers. Uh, they were known affectionately as just simply the big three. And they had the coolest nicknames, too. So Arnold Palmer was known as the king. How sweet is that? Jack Nicholas there in the middle, he was known as the golden bear. And Gary Player, the black knight. Now, these, th these three drew huge crowds wherever they went. And they, were, and they traveled extensively. They were seen all over the world. And they were almost always seen, to get, seen together. And I, I think, a, like, several years back, there was, there was, they were actually watching me together um, tee off. Do we, have, do we have that picture up here? Of the three? Yeah, you can, you can kind of see from left to right a picture of pity, um, confusion, and then really utter disgust. Uh, <laughs> um, but the big three started playing professionally together in the late 50s and all had careers that, that lasted more than five decades. Between them, they amassed uh, over 300 professional wins. There they are in their handsome master's jackets. Um, and 34 major wins. But this morning, I want to go a little bit deeper on specifically Gary Player, because he has a unique background. See, in his career, he recorded more than more, he recorded 43 more professional wins than Nicholas and 65 more than Arnold Palmer, largely due to the fact that Player, who's South African, played year-round on both the PGA Tour and other international tours. Um, he's also, Gary Player is also one of five golfers to complete golf's Grand Slam. That's winning all four majors in the same year. And he, com he accomplished that at the age of 29. Um, he's also the only golfer to have ever won the Grand Slam on both the PGA and the Seniors Tour. And lastly, and probably most impressive, he's the only golfer in the 20th century to win the British Open in three different decades. So I mention these stats and accomplishments because it perfectly sets the stage for a humorous but true account that Player told Golf Digest back in 2002. In his words, I'm going to try to do this in a South African accent. Um, <laughs> I was practicing in a bunker down in Texas, and this good old boy with a big hat stopped to watch. The first shot he saw me hit went in the hole. He said, you've got 50 bucks if you can do it again. And I hold the next one. Then he says... You've got a hundred if you can hold the next one. And in it went. For three in a row, and as he peeled off the bills, the old boy said, I have never seen anyone so lucky in my life. And I shot back. Well, the harder I practice, the luckier I get. <laughs> in other words, Gary Player prepared. And that's going to be our topic this morning. Preparation. Preparation. And I think it's safe to say that we as humans are, in general, a, a preparing kind of people. Am I, am I right? I mean, one way, one way we prepare is for the calamities of life. I mean, just think of all the different types of insurance we have. I mean, there's auto insurance, homeowner's insurance, life insurance, health insurance, disability insurance, long-term care insurance, business insurance, pet insurance, mayhem insurance. <laughs> Another way we prepare, prepare for situations is in which we have to perform. Students, you know this all too well, um, time preparing and studying to perform well on tests. Adults, you know all about preparing in the context of your jobs. You prepare important presentations, you prepare for a phone call with your boss, you go through a pre-flight checklist, you prepare a meal, you prepare lessons for kids, you check your gear as a first responder. We all prepare in some way. We prepare for the biggest events in our lives, like weddings, or even before the weddings, the proposal. Guys, remember this one? You know what I'm talking about. You want the love of your life and the whole world to know how much she means to you. So you prepare. You do crazy things like plan the perfect evening. You hide the ring in the dessert. You f somehow figure out to get yourself on the 
how to get the, on yourself at the, on the Jumbotron and the Hurricanes game, knowing full well that there still is some outside chance she could say no and reject you on national TV. Don't worry, that didn't happen here. She said yes. But we go to extremes to prepare. And why shouldn't we? God himself is a preparer. From the very beginning, God was preparing. And if you're taking notes, that's your first truth this morning. God prepares to fulfill his purpose. And notice I didn't say he prepared to fulfill his purpose. See, God is still in the preparation business. And we are so blessed to live in, to live in a time where we see his preparations coming to life, taking, taking place every day. One of the, if not the best, pictures of preparation is in Scripture. Very beginning, in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And a really cool fact about this verse um, is that in all of our more literal translations of the Bible, King James, New King James, NIV, ESV, CSB, even the New Living Translation, this verse of the Bible is always identical. Not so much as a comma difference. It's really, I thought that was a really fun fact. I mean, there, there might be some differences when translated in other languages, but I digress. So getting back to preparation, we already get the idea in just this first verse that God prepares. Now, we're all familiar with the creation story that's chronicled in Genesis 1 and 2, but this morning we're actually going to go to Psalm 104, where the psalmist describes God's purpose in his creation. So if you'd like to follow along, um, go ahead and open your Bibles or your favorite Bible app to Psalm 104, and we're going to be reading from the ESV translation. So to set a little bit of context, Psalm 104 is one of the finest pieces of lyric poetry in the Old Testament. In verses 1 through 9, we see David praising and glorifying God, referring to God's greatness, splendor, and majesty, the very breath of God, that, that ruach, his very creativity, seen in who he is in the heavens and the earth he created. Just beautiful. I, I, I encourage you to read it. But we're actually going to pick up the story in verse 10 today, uh, where we see a shift from a poem of strictly praise to acknowledging God's preparation and purpose and rhythms he's ordained. Let's look at it together. So Psalm 104, starting in verse 10. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them, the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among your br the, br the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of the man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen the man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly. The cedars of Lebanon that he planted, in them the birds build their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for wild goats, and the rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons, the sun to know it's time for setting. You make darkness and it is night, when all the beasts of the forest creep about and Hayden goes hunting. The young, the young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to labor until the evening. Just thinking about all we just read, can you think of anything God did not think of? It's incredible. Purposely prepared, complete with rhythms for everything. If God prepares like this, what about us? Genesis 127 tells us that we are created in his image. So it would only seem to reason that we too would be preparers. And that's our second truth this morning, that God prepares his people to fulfill his purpose. And we see this all throughout Scripture. And unfortunately, we don't have time to get to all the, all the examples today. I was kind of hoping to hear a collective aw. But anyway, um, <laughs> moving on, we're, we're going to look at a, at a couple uh, key figures. Starting with Isaiah, who prophesied to the Israelites, last song we heard today, prepare the way of the Messiah. Picking it up in Isaiah 40, verse 3. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley should be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low, the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. 
And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A, a passage we're pretty familiar with. We've heard, it, we've heard it a lot. And using a literal translation of the Bible, like the ESV, we get a pretty good idea of what Isaiah is saying. But check out what the message translation says. Thunder in the desert. Prepare for God's arrival. Make the road straight and smooth. A highway fit for God. Fill in the valleys, level off the hills, smooth out the ruts, clear out the rocks. Then God's bright glory will shine and everyone will see it. Yes, just as God has said. Isn't that amazing? Just, just prepare a highway fit for the Lord. You get ideas of like little drummer boy song. What can I do? Well, I can prepare the way for the Lord. This passage from Isaiah was later quoted, as you probably know, from John the Baptist, a voice in the wilderness, exhorting the people to make themselves ready to prepare themselves to receive the Messiah. So let's pick that up in Matthew, in Matthew 3. In those days, days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of, G- of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about Jordan were going out to him. And they, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, if you're familiar with the story, you know that John <laughs> ruffles a few feathers in the next verse, rebukes the um, Pharisees and Sadducees, who are nearby, calls them a brood of vipers, then makes what would have seemed like a strange statement. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. So there's some serious scriptural gems here um, in just these two verses. So one, the only way to bear fruit is in keeping with repentance. And we've talked before about the word repent literally means to turn basically 180 degrees. And if you get the idea, it's like turning your back on something so you can see something or someone else. But repentance is a little bit different. It's a noun. It's a way of life. The Blue Letter Bible, which is a great um, study resource, describes it this way. Repentance involves a turning with contrition, or in other words, remorseful humility from sin to God. The religious leaders of the day assume that their lineage, their traditions, their self-righteous piety is what sanctified them in God's eyes. In the second part of verse 9, John boldly, almost scandalously declares that God doesn't need their lineage. If you look at the verse, it's almost like John, John is saying, you Pharisees and Sadducees are no more special than these rocks. Can you imagine the indignation of the Pharisees and Sadducees who would live their whole lives thinking of their traditions, their lineage, and their customs are what sanctified them. But then John brings everything full circle with with a great equalizer. Repentance, humility, turning your back on sin so you can face God. That's how we prepare to receive God and all he has for us. Then in verse 11, John ties everything together and prepares the people for who is to come. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He, that is Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So I got to ask, what about Jesus? Did Jesus prepare? Absolutely. He lived a life of preparation that culminated at the cross. And that's our third truth this morning. Jesus perfectly prepared to fulfill God's purpose. And John declares God's purpose and his own purpose in two beautiful verses found in John chapter 6. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Y'all, can I just say there's some good news there? For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So just let let those verses sink in for a second. So what do we see here? We see promise for us, preparation from God, and purpose of our Savior. Wow. 
Two verses. So how did Jesus himself prepare? Certainly the Gospels are filled with examples, and fortunately, we don't have time to get through all of them today. Awesome. I'm heartbroken too. But I want to focus on one specific time that perfectly illustrates how Jesus had prepared and how he was preparing. Any, any guesses what that time was? Can you think of a time? Just throw it out if you can think of one. Okay, no worries. Um, it's when Jesus was being tempted by Satan. Sorry, a couple months back, the youth were groaning that they had not seen this slide for a bit. So, so y'all, this is for you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so let's pick things up in Luke 4. Um, Jesus had just gotten baptized, and Scripture tells us, and Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, this is a great picture, isn't it? Jesus himself, filled with the Holy Spirit, like, wow, does it get any better? Returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they ended, he was hungry. Yeah, I bet he was. <laughs> Y'all, if I don't eat lunch, blood sugar starts to drop, my cherub-like demeanor can diminish. You know, it's true. <laughs> you know, and Jesus was fully God and fully human. So what does the evil one go after Jesus with? Basic human necessities. You got to eat. So uh, picking up in verse 3, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, Man shall not live by bread alone. Now, I'm guessing after 40 days of eating nothing, some bread was sounding pretty good. But Jesus knows who his sustainer and who his provider is. So the devil tries again. The devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all, the author all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will be all yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and only him shall you serve. Now we all know that the devil <laughs> knows scripture too. The whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation, even maps in the concordance, the devil knows it. But it didn't occur to me until I was actually preparing this that the devil knows Jesus will eventually reign as king. You see what's going on here? And it's, it's almost like the devil is saying, step into your kingdom now. Take hold of your kingship. Why go through what we both know is in store for you? But Jesus had prepared, and he came to do the will of him who sent him. Moving on to verse 9. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, I wish I had a good devil voice, um, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put your Lord God to the test. Now this one's really interesting to me. Because both the devil and Jesus know who created the heavens and the earth. Every, every, everything we can see visible and even past that. So comparatively speaking, protecting Jesus in this situation for God would not have been that difficult. Almost laughable when you consider the unimaginable breadth of God's power. And so, when the devil had ended every temptation... He departed from him until an opportune time. So how did Jesus prepare for this moment? What did he know? Scripture. The evil one tries tempting Jesus by twisting Scripture. We see people do that all the time. But Jesus knew Scripture a lot better. His father was the author of Scripture. And if we're going to stand in 2023, then we're going to need to know Scripture. And that's our last truth this morning, that we must make preparation a priority. But do we? Y'all, it's just time to get really honest with ourselves, personal spiritual inventory time, and believe me, I'm holding up the mirror to myself. 
We've touched on a a number of ways we prepare. And yes, preparing for the good, the bad, the ugly is a thoughtful and responsible thing to do. But do we prepare with that same kind of fervor for what or who we know from the Bible tells us is coming? See, Jesus fulfilled over 300 unique prophecies and scriptures that related to the coming of the Messiah. Jesus' first coming. But did you know there are over 800 prophecies relating to his second coming? And we see those being fulfilled daily with an ever-quickening frequency. Everything is coming together and converging exactly how the Bible says it will. So are we preparing like Jesus did by intimately knowing Scripture? Do we make it a priority? Years ago, um, late author and pastor A.W. Tozer wrote, One great concern I have is that many of today's Christians are not taking the word of God seriously. For whatever reason, the scriptures do not have the authority in the Christian's life in a way that is necessary for him or her to live a life to the glory of God. Wow, that's, (laughs) that's pretty pointed. But it's important to note that Tozer passed away in 1963. So this quote is at least 60 years old. Do you think Scripture has more or less authority in lives now? No. Tozer completed by saying, if we are going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, then we must start by taking the Bible seriously. David Jeremiah echoed the same urgency back in uh, September of just this past year when he wrote this. We must take the scriptures seriously because the scriptures take the Lord seriously. We learn about Jesus through his word, his eternal glory, his remarkable humanity, his infinite wisdom, his glorious resurrection, his current enthronement, his swift coming, and his everlasting reign. By turning our eyes to the Bible... We're turning our gaze to him. You get that idea of repentance again. Leave this behind. Focus on him. And that changes the way that we view the trails and trials of earth. Beloved, do we see the trials of earth increasing and intensifying? Let's be honest. Yeah, absolutely. But if we prepare ourselves in Scripture, we know that the Bible told us it would be this way. Jesus himself discussed this with his disciples on the Mount of Olives in what would become known as the Olivet Discourse. Uh, Read with me here in Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 3. And he sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. There, you know, I've heard before there are 365 fear knots in the Bible, one for every day, supposedly. I've never tried looking it up myself, but I've heard it multiple times. But yeah, again, fear not. Do not be alarmed. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are but the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arrive and lead many astray. And because lawlessness has increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. So looking back on on all that, do we hear of wars and rumors of wars? Nation rising against nation. I was actually going to build a slide with a bunch of headlines. But even in the headlines, just from the past week, we, we would... We would have way too many slides to go through. It's crazy. Famines or food shortages. Do we hear about that? <laughs> Absolutely. What about a falling away? Apostasy. People growing cold. I think we can all agree the answer is a resounding yes. So what do we do? 
we prepare. By being in Scripture, sharing the good news of the gospel with a lost, hurting, confused, and terrified world. And I get it, that it's tough. It, it, it might be weird. You know what? I just got to tell you quickly, um, Ezekiel. Yeah, the prophet Ezekiel. Like 40, roughly 39, 40 chapters of Ezekiel. Very famous prophet. He, in uh, Ezekiel 33, he was called Israel's watchman. We all know about um, chapter 37, prophesying the valley of the dry bones. The Gog and Magog prophecy of, of Ezekiel 38, which we see those, um, <laughs> those treaties and those alliances coming together today. Um, but all the way back in Ezekiel 2, God told him, yeah, I want you to do this. I want you to prophesy to my people, but, oh yeah, there's one catch. They're not going to listen to you. But yet, he still continued to preach and to prophesy. And, and beloved, that's what we need to do. Philippians 2.15 tells us that we ought to live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. So shine the light. Shine with a peace and confidence that knowing no matter how crazy the world looks, God is still in control. A world full of crooked and perverse people will take notice of that kind of peace. Your friends will notice. Your coworkers will notice. And maybe, just maybe, they'll ask you why you have this peace. Are you ready to tell them? I have a good friend, Michael, who runs his church's prison ministry in Jacksonville, Florida. And about a week ago, he sent, me a tech, he sent a text to me and about 10 of, other, 10 of our other friends with a picture um, of how we should prepare for 2023 or until the Lord calls us home. Now, I did ask permission to share this, and his response was something to the effect of, uh, I actually didn't write this. I got this from a buddy's brother's nephew's cousin's former coworker. so yeah, go right ahead, share it. So what he wrote was, hello, welcome to flight 2023. We are prepared to take off into the new year. Please make sure your, al your attitude and blessings are secured and locked in an upright position. All self-destructive devices should be turned off at this time. All negativity, hurt, and discouragement should be put away. Should we lose altitude under pressure during the flight, reach up and pull down a prayer. Prayers will automatically be activated by faith. Once your faith is activated, you can assist other passengers. There's some gold right there. There will be no baggage allowed in this flight. The captain, God, has cleared us for takeoff. Destination greatness. Book your flight. Then, he add, then Michael adds his own comment. Yes, I've already purchased my ticket. I'm buckled in and ready for takeoff. How about you? Have you purchased your ticket? You buckled in? You ready for takeoff? The irony of me sharing that is that, um, as some of you know this, that I'm not a really big fan of flying. I, st I still do fly regularly. You just gotta. But, and I admit, most flights are pretty uneventful. But sometimes... They're not. I've been in less than ideal landing situations, had my fair share of turbulence, but nothing ever prepared me, and I will never forget the feeling of hitting an air pocket. About 10 years ago, I was flying from Atlanta um, back to Fayetteville in a pretty small regional plane, and we hit an air pocket. For a second or two, it felt like we were literally falling out of the sky. There was an audible gasp of everyone on board, myself included. And in that brief moment of terror, I was this close to reaching for the ejection seat cords and telling Goose to watch the canopy. <laughs> Things were made turbulent for the remainder of the flight, but largely steadied out. Our pilot landed us safely, we got off the plane, and went on about our way. The lesson here is that as passengers, when we hit that air pocket, we were terrified, probably because we hadn't prepared for that situation. But the pilot had, probably for years, and they were in complete control. Beloved, the same is true about God. He is in control. 
And if we trust the one who created the heavens and the earth to one day bring us home to his glory, surely we can fearlessly trust him with whatever 2023 holds. Nothing that's happened in all of history has ever surprised God, and nothing that happens in 2023 or beyond ever will. I'm going to go ahead and invite the band back up. And we're going to end today with a different airplane story, one that might be a bit more familiar. Does anybody recognize this guy? Sully, yes. Captain Chelsea Sully Sullenberger. He's the pilot who back in 2009 piloted U.S. Airways Flight 1549 out of New York's LaGuardia Airport. Two minutes and 15 seconds in the flight, the Airbus A320 he was piloting struck a flock of geese at an altitude of only 2,818 feet, causing both engines to fail. The aircraft continued to climb for a few more seconds, reaching a max altitude of 3,060 feet at an airspeed of only 213 miles an hour. Then, Sully began a glide descent. At 3.27 and 33 seconds, Sully radioed a mayday call to air traffic control. This is Cactus 1539. Hit birds. We lost thrust on both engines. We're turning back to LaGuardia. Air traffic control told LaGuardia's tower to hold all departures and directed Sully back to runway 31, to which she simply responded, unable. Sully asked controllers for landing operations at uh, nearby Teterboro, New Jersey airport, about seven miles away. Permission was granted, to which, initially, to which Sully initially responded, yes, but then said, we can't do it. We're going to be in the Hudson. He didn't have time to discuss it further with the air traffic control. He took control. And he landed the plane. All 155 people, 150 passengers and five crew members landed safely, some with minor injuries. The other amazing fact is that even in the emergency water landing, Sully was alert enough to land the plane near boats in order to speed the rescue. And two New York waterway ferries did arrive within minutes. So how did Sully accomplish this task? He was prepared. You see, Sully had been flying for 42 years, since he was 16 years old. In his freshman year at the Air Force Academy, he was in the cadet glider program. Be some good experience to have if you have to glide an Airbus down. And at the end of the, by the end of that year, he was an instructor pilot. He later flew F-4s in the 493rd Tactical Fighter Squadron at Royal Air Force Base in Lockenhaith, um, UK, and then the 428th Tactical Fighter Squadron at Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada. He advanced to become a flight leader and training officer and attained the rank of captain. He later became a commercial airline pilot with U.S. Airways. Many more impressive accolades on his resume that we just don't have time to mention. But beloved, it's in the unexpected, the times of chaos, the times of emergency, that you find out how good your pilot is. And whatever you're going through now, or whatever 2023 holds, know that our pilot, God Almighty, is in control, and he will land you safely. We're going we're gonna to do one more song. Um, this is a special time. I, I invite you to rise. Uh, the altar is going to be open if you want to come. Just to be obedient. If, if you have something that God's laid in your heart, please come. No one's going to bother you. This is a sacred, sacred time. This is a sacred space. Just be obedient. Prepare.